So we are live here for a Psych for Sore Minds doing something that I don't usually do, which is a live stream with a friend of the channel and a friend of mine, Andrew Gold. How are you doing, Andrew? Very good. Thank you for having me, Dr. Shaham. It's an absolute pleasure. Is there a is there a, a counter of how many people are on this? Oh, there it is up there, nine. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. so welcome everybody, the nine of you that are watching. Um, we will be asking Andrew about what I think is a very interesting and controversial uh, interview that he's had recently on his channel. It brought my attention and I just thought there was a bit of psychological exploration in exactly what happened. So do you want to tell us what's, what your... Well, actually, first of all, tell, do, you, do, you mind start, do you mind starting by telling us who Lloyd Evans is? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, thanks again for having me on. Good to be here on this lovely channel. I've been on here before, haven't I? And it's the first time we're, we're both we're both getting into YouTube. It's quite a funny thing because uh, I guess I guess we in quite an oh is it is it pretentious way we're both sort of we come from these non youtube backgrounds of course you're a forensic psychiatrist and I am an investigative journalist and we're getting into this YouTube world and we're getting into these lives and things and it's really good fun to do. So Lloyd Evans. Uh, Huh. He was a Jehovah's Witness. So I do a lot of videos talking to uh, people who have left cults and I look into like the cultish mind and the ideologies that we can all fall for. And it doesn't have to be religion and stuff like that. It can also be uh, extreme politics. And so like, people who have gone far right, people who have gone far left, that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm fascinated by that kind of thing. Lloyd Evans, um, he became a huge name in the ex-Jehovah's Witness uh, game or business as as I don't think he'd like to call it but you know this is YouTube and he was making a lot of money it was mad actually I used to go and look at his live streams sometimes and I didn't even know being quite a novice with YouTube uh, I didn't know that you could even like give money to people while they're talking and he would get just from talking for an hour about the Jehovah's Witness Church the the JW Watchtower they would call it uh, upwards of like $3,000, I think, or at least in the thousands. It was insane amounts, um, lots of money, and that's you know, nothing wrong with that. So he left the cult of Jehovah's Witnesses or the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses, became a big name himself as the ex-JWs, as they're known, and created a huge community around that. So that is just a brief, I go into a lot more, but that's just to give you a brief idea of, of who Lloyd Evans is. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. So now that we know who he is, how did you get into con how did you guys get into contact and what brought about the interview that you did? So I first spoke to him over a year ago, uh, just as another episode. You know, this one episode a week, nothing unusual about it. It was just, you know, I'd found him online somewhere and just okay, here's an episode about what it's like to grow up in the JW or Jehovah's Witness Church. Uh, I was really, really interested in like, you know, they do a lot of uh, doorstepping, you know, they go from door to door, you may have had them come to your house yourself. Uh, do you want to, you know, know the truth, that kind of thing. Um, and it was just a really interesting thing. He told me about how, you know, his his family would prepare him for the apocalypse when he was younger and all kinds of things that we might even equate with some level of abuse, particularly around sexual repression, which which is a common theme I find with all the cult leavers I speak to, whether it be Mormons or Scientologists, or there's always seems to be this sort of sexual repression, uh, Hasidic Jews, extreme Islam, sexual repression that is going on. Now, that does become quite important later on in Lloyd's story. Okay, so, I'm just going to interrupt you just yeah, for a second, Andrew. I just want to say for mm. all these uh, kind people who are joining in the conversation, I imagine that a reasonable proportion of you are ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. So if that's the case, please let us know. And also the things that Andrew's talking about, so the sexual uh, repression, is that something that you that sounds familiar mm. to you? What were your experiences? Let us know and we'll, we'll shout you out. Sorry, continue, yeah. Andrew. No, that's a great point. It's, it's always great to hear from people. The last few days, I should say, my, my page has been inundated with some ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. There were already a high proportion of ex-JWs on my channel just from having interviewed Lloyd the previous year and being into all the cultish stuff, the cultish language, because I think a lot of these people left these cults. They want to fully understand what the thing they were in is and how it works. To be honest, a lot of them have a better understanding than I do. They experienced it themselves. But I think uh, the people like us, we can offer, you know, me from a journalistic perspective, you from a psychiatric perspective, we can offer different views, just outside of views, which which adds to make a composite of the whole cult aspect, the whole cult thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was... Um, 
a normal interview really and we got on very well and he was a big YouTuber and I was just dipping my toe into YouTube at that time because my podcast is audio normally it's on Spotify and Apple and that's where I earn my living I earn a living doing that and have been doing for a few years and I brought it onto YouTube just at the point when I first interviewed Lloyd and so I had a Patreon and all that set up and Lloyd encouraged me he was very nice and supportive with me and he started contributing to my Patreon you know he was getting quite a lot on his own Patreon that's by the way for those who don't know it's a membership uh, where you offer maybe a YouTuber offers extra bonus stuff or adds free material um, and you pay a few pounds or dollars a month typically for various different bonuses and things so he was very supportive very nice and we kept in touch a little bit you know we'd see each other on twitter that kind of thing he was getting in a couple of arguments with with other friends of mine about things that i thought were a little bit ideological he he seemed to be very far left and quite uh you know woke is what we'd call it very progressive and that kind of thing which is fine now I get, should I go into the recent controversy? Yes, please do. Please tell us what happened with the interview and when it, why it all started to go sour. Okay, so this was now like a year and a half later. And I suddenly saw that a lot of the ex-JWs on my channel, they would mention Lloyd in the comments and stuff. So I went to, see, went to Twitter to see what was going on. And what emerged was Lloyd... Oh, and, and an important part of this is that a lot of what Lloyd talks about on his channel is about exposing the Jehovah's Witness Church for sex trafficking and sort of that kind of thing, taking advantage of people sexually. Um, Lloyd uh, confessed uh, unsolicited, unsolicitedly, I want to say, but without, without being asked, um, to his producers on his show that he had been seeing uh, sex workers. Now, Lloyd's married with children. Now, the first thing I thought of is, well, that, it's none of our business because you can do what you want. I mean, people do things that are supposed to be immoral. Personally, I don't trust people who seem to be moral all the time, who don't ever transgress our societal laws or whatever. I think there's something a bit odd about people who just toe the line. So if anything, it made me think like, okay, bit bit dodgy, but none of my business. Um, until I saw more and more about it and people were saying, well, you know, okay, Sex workers is one thing, but a lot of this was apparently, allegedly in Thailand, where there's it's known that a lot of people are uh, trafficked to, to go there. There's a lot of this, the very thing that Lloyd talks about. And when you combine that with the fact, as a lot of XJWs were telling me, um, that they were giving to his Patreon, they were giving him thousands in his live streams, they're paying him to do his advocacy work so that he, um, you know, and then he goes and does the very thing that he's preaching uh, against. Anyway, so Lloyd gets in touch. Or, Wait, before we get or, into to that, if you don't mind, just to clarify, sure. what was he when you say that he's exposed the Jehovah's Witness um, movement for sex trafficking? What specifically is he alleging? Like, is it what it seems like that they actually were involved in it? So they actively would get people and make them workers, uh, sex workers. No, no. Uh, so I don't know that much about it, but what I know is that. The J, the JW. Oh, we need people in the comments to help with this. But from what I can gather, the church makes a point. It's like the policy, almost like company policy, is not to report any uh, sexual abuse that goes on in there. What happens within the church stays within the church. So it, I don't think it's that you know some sort of cult where we're going to raise people to be child whatevers. I'm going to I'm going to skirt around particular words that might get your YouTube channel uh, demonetized or whatever. But it, it was it was very clear that there were, you were not to uh, you were not to, to report anything that goes on in there, and then I think obviously look, Lloyd was reporting for ten years, so a lot of it might have been about all sorts of things. And to be honest, I didn't look that deeply into it. So again, people in the in the you know you've got people our, our saying good friend, our good friend mm. Ash has uh, helped by by explaining that it's not sex trafficking. It's it's just that there was not report they yeah. were not reporting the abuse. Yeah, I've had it. Look, I've had it said to me that that Lloyd talked about sex trafficking. The thing is, it's very hard to research. I do typically research a lot, but he's done like a million videos over ten years, so it's very hard to know. Uh, but he does touch on sex trafficking, from what I've heard. But the main thing in the JW like stuff was hiding uh, child sex abuse, as fade to X says in the comments there. And uh, it the sounds two... like it sounds mm. like you're saying that he was getting money from um, <clears throat> from his seemingly altruistic work to try and challenge this and tackle this but it's a bit dodgy there's some suspicions about what he's using the money for is that fair 
Yeah, well, that's what it is. Uh, and, and I should just say, Tom Shepard in the comments saying it's a two-witness rule. They need two Jehovah's Witnesses to witness something before taking any action. So it's sort of a, you know, when are there ever going to be two people watching? It's very unlikely unless we're talking about uh, grooming and that kind of, you know, these gangs. So th it was basically a way of saying we will never report this stuff. And Lloyd did some fantastic work. Uh, exposing a lot of it and he's very angry about it quite rightly because he was brought up in it but then you know to do what he did it's just very very complicated and I'm in two minds about it as well because you do have uh, you have to think about the private and 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 the public Lloyd made himself into a very public figure whether he wanted to or not and with that comes a level of responsibility particularly when you're dealing with uh, the kinds of people who were following him who who were very vulnerable they were people who just came out of something that was the very cult that Lloyd is talking against uh, and it meant that there was some sort of and a lot of XJWs have told me this like they've a lot of them are saying um, going some of them had a break between leaving Jehovah's Witnesses and then finding Lloyd and they find it all a lot easier to to deal with some people went straight from the Jehovah's Witnesses into sort of the Lloyd Evans channel and in some senses and everybody disagrees to what extent it feels like they just replicated the same cult dynamic with another uh, sort of flamboyant leader in this case in this case Lloyd, Lloyd Evans so can you give us a couple of examples please of what you know about Andrew of the way that the the behavior is similar from the Jehovah's Witness to coming into his camp Sure. I mean, so so here's here's the thing. I recently did a course for um, uh, for YouTube, and I, so I, what I'm going to say about Lloyd, it's not dissimilar to a lot of uh, YouTubers. Um, it's 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 something we all have to do to an extent. If you and it's the same in business. It's the same in so and there are levels of cult. So I'm not suggesting that Lloyd Evans is like you know, Jim Jones of the, the Jonestown massacre, you know, the cult suicides and things like that. It's it's nothing like that. But there are certain echoes. And to become a top YouTube leader, that you're often told you need to do things like rituals and certain things that you say every time. Uh, and Lloyd would pick up on um, sayings of the church and then he would subvert them and use them as his own sayings. So uh, one I, I picked up on, for example, just from having a little look through some of his videos, was he has a social media editor or something called Tibor, and he would say, if Tibor is gracious, and it would mean like, if Tibor is willing to, he'll put a picture above me now. Like, if Tibor is gracious. This is speaking in sort of pious words and language. It's cultish language. Um, I had a guest on my podcast called Amanda Montel, who's fantastic talking about uh, the language of cults, the way that it's all about language. I mean, language is manipulation uh, in a sense and it depends how how you use it so so that kind of thing is 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 important then there are rituals you know the way he says says hello every time again a lot of youtubers do this uh, icons for example uh, that yellow light behind me that could be considered one for example the blue you know you're you've got that wheel right but you're sometimes doing your videos in different locations at the moment yeah. but you know someone sees that wheel someone sees you've got a teddy bear uh, on <laughs> don't you on the on the bed is that right or somewhere I I've usually have some sort of uh, cuddly toy in the background, yeah, or dinosaur. Yeah, which is fantastic. It's my favourite part. It's the only part of your show I like. But <laughs> th those kinds of things all, all add together to make up a, a, a cult leader. But but the main thing that holds it together to, to be a bit culty is creating what they call uh, non-believers. So it's creating another side and us against them. Now, obviously, Lloyd being, you know, uh, an XJW, his whole point was about the non-believers to his channel, who ironically are the believers, they're Jehovah's Witnesses. But it's creating an enemy. And whether he meant to or not, over the years, he came, and his show came to depend uh, on sort of the madness of and the continuance of the, the Je Jehovah's Witnesses. If they suddenly packed up and went away, he'd have nothing left. And that, so again, it's not necessarily his fault, but he finds himself in a situation that becomes increasingly open to becoming toxic. Um, and I, I, I use um, the Arsenal fan TV as a good example of this as well. Anyone who's into soccer or football, uh, the uh, Arsenal is a team and they have a fan club uh, on YouTube who do extremely well. They get like millions of views and I've interviewed them as well. And because the most pressing point with them is uh, and what they get a lot of criticism for is that the, when the team do badly and they lose like 4-0 against Liverpool, those are the best performing videos. The worse the team does, the best, the better the videos perform. There's a similar symbiotic 
symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with Lloyd and his um, and the Jehovah's Witnesses. The more crazy, awful things they do, the more views he gets. And that's quite common to YouTube, but it does create a toxic environment for people who have left Jehovah's Witnesses and end up in what you might call the cult of Lloyd Evans. Okay, okay, that's really helpful, thank you. So for, I've watched bits of the interview that you did with him and it seemed to be fairly pleasant throughout throughout uh, it certainly it started off that way so can you explain how things started to go down south yeah it all went a bit sour Here, here's the thing like i mean you'll know this when you have people on who you interview in your channel it's very very difficult to confront them um and there are a few reasons for that so so my background in journalism so typically i, I would make documentaries for the bbc or hbo or whoever it was and what would happen is the TV channel or, or whoever else, the production company, would organize for me to speak with some person who might have unsavory views, for example, uh, an abusive exorcist who's taking advantage of young women in his church or something like that. I've never met the exorcist. I've never, you know, I may not have had dealings with that person. And then I turn up and I'm there to interrogate them. Now, what happens when it's your own channel on YouTube or an audio podcast or something is that you talk and you become friends. And Lloyd, of course, had been putting money into my Patreon account. It was only £1.50 a month, but it was like 18 months that he was doing that. And it was just a nice, supportive thing. Yeah. So to then be like, hey, mate, you know, and I said to him, I can see that this is really awful what, what's happening with you. And he said he'd like to come on my show and clear the air. And as you say, it was OK, the chat. I did try and push him. And say like, look, the problem here was that he wouldn't apologize. Uh, apart from to his wife, he wouldn't admit any wrongdoing, any any problem with the fact that he was doing the very thing that a lot of people saw he was preaching against. And regardless of his opinion on it, so so many people in his community were hurt by it, and he just refused to sort of take their thoughts on board. So but, could I just yeah. ask? Are you saying that he? He was apologizing to his wife because obviously that meant that he was having extramarital affairs, but he didn't see anything ethically wrong with using sex workers or prostitutes. Is that how he came yeah. across? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which which is, again, I, in fact, I think he sees it. And from how he's spoken before on his channel and from what other XJWs have been telling me, he sees it understandably as like a progressive thing in a sense. Um that f he had like a sex worker on before, for example, and a lot of, on, 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 sorry, on his show. And a lot of people were commenting saying, hey, this isn't right, given that a lot of us were abused and this kind of thing. We don't, it's quite triggering for you to be putting a sex worker on. And he, I, I, again, I think it's understandable because there's different points of view and I'm really open to plurality of opinion and thought and that's what my show is about. And I think that's a valid argument that he has, which is like, hey, look, sex workers, they can do, you know, they're, they're valid people as well and it's valid work and they some of them take pride in their work. But yeah. the key thing here is some of them and many not many who don't take pride in that work, many are trafficked, many are yeah. taken advantage of. Um, so the, the so crux yeah. of the matter, as I see it, and correct me if I'm wrong, and please in the comments section uh, throw in your opinions, is that it's a balance, isn't it? Because on the one hand, what he was doing is related to his personal life and, you know, if he wants to look for vices by using sex workers then that's kind of his personal business generally speaking but you could argue that in this case it's different because he's actually campaigning against well, he's not campaigning against prostitution per se but he's campaigning against the jehovah's witnesses um at least cover up of of um sexual abuse that's occurred is that basically yeah. what it's about yeah yeah he's campaigning against vulnerable young people being taken advantage of and being you know put into sexual relationships and, and that kind of thing that you know being abused basically uh and and i think i think given that i think he had a responsibility not to do what he was doing and you know yeah i agree with you what he did to his family look and, and also we, we will say like look private matter none of our business but it, it's quite it's bad man i mean he, it, it is quite bad to just leave your kids and family and stuff and go off on like a holiday to thailand um and you know, he was on on my video with him. I didn't even notice at the time. He admitted he was he was dating a sex worker. So at that point, we're talking about a married man with kids saying that he was off dating a sex worker. And you're thinking, I don't think he quite understands um, the blurred lines of consent when you're dating a sex worker. Uh, that's that's not to say that sex workers can't outside of their work be dating people. But that doesn't seem to be what was really happening because Lloyd went away on a holiday. He wasn't like off there for, you know, living there as far as I, I know. So it is a bit, none of my business, you might say, it's a bit bad. 
But the main thing, as you say, is he, I guess he let down his community. He did something that was quite hypocritical, given what he said, but he refused to admit to any of it. And if you refused to take responsibility for any of it. And what do you think that's about? Do you think that's because he genuinely doesn't think that what anything he's done is wrong? Or do you think he's too embarrassed? Or do you think he hmm. might have apologized in different circumstances but felt that you were pressurizing him or a combination of those things what do you think it was about it's really hard and i did push him about the fact you know that a lot of people say never apologize and when you do apologize to a baying mob uh it's never enough so i do get that there was that recent thing with the comedian kevin hart who had made uh homophobic comments like 10 years ago and he was supposed to he apologized at the time it was a joke he made but it was offensive and he apologized and 10 years later he was asked to speak at the oscars and um somebody sort of found those old tweets and they resurfaced and the oscars asked him to apologize and he was like i've already apologized i'm not apologizing a second time because at what point is it enough and we all know that that can be a sort of a toxic behavior in itself. You know, if you've got a relationship, if you've got a wife or a husband or whatever it might be, and they do something a bit wrong and you're, you never ex you want more apology and more apology. And at what point do you say like, hey, this is about me desperately wanting some sort of power over this person. Yeah. So I do have sympathy for him not wanting to apologize. That said, this went on for months and months and people were clearly really hurt. This wasn't making a point and wanting to have power over him in, in the most part. They were hurt by it and they wanted an apology. So I think part of it's that and I think part of it is, you know, I mean, you could tell, you tell me, I mean, you, you watched the interview. What are your thoughts about, it, we never know, do we, what someone really thinks. So is it a case of he didn't feel sorry, didn't think he did anything wrong and he was standing by it or he knew he was wrong but didn't want to apologise? I think from what I saw, he was a bit blindsided by the whole thing. So I think that he expected it to be like a unchallenging, fairly sort of pleasant, neutral conversation. And I think you even said this on your other video that you put in your channel that it's it was um, a bit awkward for you and a bit of a moral dilemma because I think you used the words, you're not Lloyd's PR person, right? So it, he asked to come on your channel and so if he's asking to come on your channel, knowing that you're an investigative journalist and knowing what you're about, which is, you know, challenging beliefs in an open way, then he's got to expect that not every question is going to be um, like a PR opportunity for him. Mm. So I think he I think he, he reacted. Uh, you could see him being his sort of mind ticking. And I think he was a bit blindsided, although did at least on the surface seem to handle it quite well. He didn't seem to get particularly flustered. But it appears that, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, it was afterwards that he became more threatening. Is that right? Mm. Well, so this this was the thing. Um, we we spoke, and he was happy with it. He was afterwards. He said he thought I was fair. He understood. And I had a niggling feeling afterwards that I was like, oh, I, sh I didn't go in as hard as I should have done. But, you know... Yeah, so what would that have I'm, looked like if you did go in harder? What would you have... Said? I think I could have gotten... Uh, a little more flustered and a little and it's something I struggle to do and, and and it's for those very reasons I spoke of before with the podcast it's a case of you know I've invited this person on I'm sitting there what people don't see when you are interviewing someone they don't see the bits before all the messages hey mate how are you doing you want to come on my podcast they don't see the bit that we just had before for example where I'm going like yeah is your headphones all right how's your camera mate is it all right do you mind sending me the audio after because it's clearer on your view all that kind of thing and then I'm supposed to go mate you were out of order. That wasn't right what you did. And your people, you know, and that's what, you know, people in the UK will know the reference, but Jeremy Paxman or someone, he was able to do that for years. Certain journalists do that. They do these uh, these pieces on, say, celebrities that just tear them apart. And I've always felt it, that's not really me. I find it very, very difficult to do. But that's what it would have looked like. It would have looked like me going, Lloyd, come on, mate. Like, okay, it's not just your family. You've said sorry to your family, but the XJWs want some sort of recognition that you did something that flies in the face of what you're, you're expected to do. You, you're human, you make mistakes, and you get past it. But by not apologising at all, I think that was very difficult. So that's what that would have looked like, yeah. I suppose there's a slight irony in that he probably wanted to look like he was standing his ground, and that's why he didn't apologise. But actually, it's become more of an issue now than <laughs> than it would have been had he just said a quick sorry. So do you have you heard directly from XJWs uh, expressing their uh, discontent at what he's done? So this is not just mm. your message, is it? It's also from what that community is saying. Is that correct? 
Yeah, a hundred percent. And again, this is the difficulty of being a journalist. You're right in the middle and you want to be impartial and you don't know who to listen to because everybody has different ideas about what's going on. But what changed everything with this was, as you say, like after after the video, <clears throat> we, we spoke, uh, we were speaking on, right. So what I do is I release the audio version of the podcast in the morning. So I did that Monday morning or Thursday morning it was. Um, and then later in the evening at 9 p.m. I put it out live. So I'm in the chat on the side and people are watching the video for the first time on YouTube. And I expected people to come in and some people to be defending him and some to be against him. And that's what Lloyd sort of imagined as well. I also understand that those who are discontented or whatever are the loudest. The, you know, the angry voices are going to be the loudest. So I knew there'd be a bit more being angry at him, but I thought there'd be some angry defenders as well, and it would be a whole war. That's not what I found at all. What happened was every single commenter, every chat person, or un unless I, I mean, apart from one or two, but hundreds of them were against Lloyd and they weren't even talking about the sex worker situation they were saying uh, he's been bullying me for years he's been, he blocked me when I suggested something he was incredibly rude to me he's threatened to sue me I think there were 12 people he's threatened to sue and again it's the hypocrisy thing because he put out so many videos having a go at the Jehovah's Witness community and the the, the watchtower that it's called because they were what he calls litigious but then he goes out and starts, you know, threatening to sue people who shut him down. So that's another example about of how he was acting like the cult that he was part of before. And when you say bullying people, what format has that taken? Is that only on social media or have you heard yeah. of people where he's he's like actually bullied them in real life or over time? No, I've not, there's no real life stuff. I mean, he lives out in Croatia, so he's quite far away from uh, the whole thing. Um, I, and I, I, I don't know about any like real life bullying, but. In well, I might just this. quickly ask people in the comments if anybody knows, just to enlighten mm. us, if there are any specific examples that you know of of, um, of the allegations yeah. against Lloyd. It would be very helpful. Sorry, I interrupted you, Andrew. Carry on. No, 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 you're right. You're right. That's a good point to ask, actually. Um, so, yeah, he, it, it's online, and it's, it's a case where people would message, like, hi, Lloyd, this thing that you said, like, I'm not sure that's right, and he would block them immediately or shut them down. Some people talked about what they call doxing, which is when he would take somebody's information and put them out like um, on Twitter. I mean, what, I, having not been in the XJW community, this wasn't stuff I saw. It was all going on sort of in the background. The only time I saw some of it was when it was related to a friend of mine called Stephen Knight, who is, he's got the Godless Spellchecker yeah, uh, podcast. Yeah. Yeah, so Stephen's great, and he's he's like funny, very centrist. He's on the center of each, in the center of each issue, and he sort of makes fun of the extremes a little bit. Um, and he suggested at one point that Lloyd had become religious. I think in another sense, like that he was woke, or you know, after leaving one religion, he's joined another, so to speak. And Lloyd got so upset with him that he reported him to Ricky Gervais because Stephen Knight's a close friend of Ricky Gervais. Well, not a close friend, but they've worked together before and they're sort of friends. And so Lloyd was like, I wonder what Ricky Gervais. And it was at one time that I'd seen like, oh, OK, this is a bit. You know, we're all um, we're all creators here. We're all content makers, and I think like Shaham, if you said something on Twitter that I didn't agree with, either I'd just leave it like, oh, I don't agree with that, but he's like a mate of mine. I, whatever happens, I'm not going to start going like, you know, to someone else and saying, have you seen what Shaham's writing? Unless it's very extreme, you know. Do, do you know what I mean? Also, Ricky Gervais never returns my calls, so you probably wouldn't have much, uh, much success <laughs> there. Stop, stop returning mine as well. I did try and get him on my show, actually, and I got through to, from, like, to one person to another to another of his, like, agent people, and I was getting along the line, and then one said, sorry, he doesn't have the time, which was very sad. <laughs> I think he does have the time. <laughs> <laughs> So can you tell us a little bit about threatening to sue you? So yeah. what, how did that come about and what's that about? And is it still an issue now? Right. So, so again, so what happened was, uh, as, all, as more people were in the chat, I should just say, in, in the YouTube video, as we're showing this interview between me and Lloyd, and everybody's telling me, you know, he bullied me, he doxxed me, he did this and that, uh, you need to speak to the producer who was, who made the allegations in the first place um, who, who's called Kim and Kim was was his like producer on YouTube and stuff um, and he told her for some reason about all this stuff and she sort of got it out there and everybody's saying you call yourself a journalist why don't you speak to Kim and I said oh I can't it's just going to turn into a circus this is going to be and it's embarrassing and it's too much and it's going to be piling on to him and all that stuff but I found myself running out of excuses as to why 
I wasn't interviewing her as well as a professional journalist. I'm not a YouTuber. I like to see myself with the, the you know the pretense I have as a journalist. So I, while it's all going on, the video is premiering on YouTube. I messaged Lloyd and set on Twitter, and I just said to him, "Listen, mate, I think I've got to interview Kim straight after this to hear her side. I'm really sorry, mate." And I think a normal way to respond to that, like if someone had said that to me, would be like, look, I'd really rather you didn't. I'm feeling so low at the moment. Can't we take a break and like consider this later? Because I'm a bit, you know, and all that. But that wasn't what happened. Um, he came back quite aggressively and made accusations of me being a tabloid sensationalist journalist, um, which is a sore point for most journalists. It was a sore point for me. And I did used to work at The Sun, so he has a point, really. But that was my first job. I was at The Sun. Well, it's just I couldn't find a job anywhere else. Um, but it's it's basically that's having a go straight at your integrity. But I, it also made me see how he was sort of emotionally pulling the strings. And it was exactly what I'd heard uh, from people in the XJW community about how he'd spoken to them. It was very manipulative. It was saying like, oh, you want to speak to and see the other side, do you? Well, that makes you, uh, a, you know, a, a bad journalist. That makes you yeah. essentially a bad person. So we had this back and forth and I'm going, mate, I really think I have to do it. And the closer he could see the more des that, that I was going to interview her and get to the truth of the whole thing, the more desperate he got. And he said, listen, if you do this, I'm going to have to withdraw my Patreon. I hope you realize that, you know, and I'm like, mate, it's one pound 50 a month. Like, what a weird thing to say. And what kind of journalist would I be if I was like, OK, I won't search for the truth. Then I won't pursue the truth because I could really do this one pound 50 a month. At least offer like a few grand or something if you want to buy my integrity. So <laughs> how much does and then the I would say it depends because I, I don't think I take a bribe in terms of money. I'm not that motivated by money because I'm, as long as I'm okay, I don't need luxuries and stuff. I would take if somebody were able to say, "Look, I'll give you a million YouTube subscribers, so then you can earn from YouTube forever and do what you." I think I'd be like, "Oh, maybe I'd lose my integrity then if you're going to give me a million. <laughs> but no, I'm, I am j half joking. No, I'm joking. But like one pound fifty certainly wasn't going to do it. So I'm like, okay. And, and the, the problem was psychologically for me at this point, I'm like, well, I have to do it now. You know, I've just been basically uh, bribed not to do it. And as a journalist, I have to do it now. And then as he, his final sort of clutching at straws, he says to me, if, you know, if you do this, Kim's going to be lying to you uh, and she will lie. She's a psychopathic liar or something like that. She's a uh, something like that. And uh, I'm going to have to add you to my list of litigation. And at that point, I just blocked him because I'm just not I'm just not going to hear that. And that's a red flag to a bull with with journalists, any journalist worth their salt. If somebody you're doing a story on says, don't speak to that person or I will sue you and take money away from you. You're like, right, I 100 percent have to do this interview now. So I did it with with Kim, the producer. She basically talked about a lot of what we've just spoken about. And it went wild because uh, a lot of people were waiting for somebody from outside the community to expose a lot of this stuff for a long time. So it was like a, a real rush of endorphins and it's it's been it's been nice. And my concern now is talking too much about it, I, you know, for too long. And I, uh, I sort of after today might want to draw a line under it, you know? Yeah, to be to be fair to you, uh, in conversations we've had today, you were a little bit tired of speaking about it all, but I'm one that's kind of tempted you out just because I think it's really interesting. Uh, you gossiper. So I wanted to get your take. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know. What I was thinking when you were, when you're describing him. I know this is um, a cliche to say, but he does sound like a quite a bond or typical narcissist to me. So. Oh yes, tell me. I, I want to hear. I want to hear the psychiatric uh, review from afar. Yeah. So obviously, I've not got the um, privilege of interviewing him or assessing him in person, but from the little that I, the little that I know from what you're saying. People just think that narcissism is about wanting to be the centre of attention and um, wanting to to look good in everybody's eyes and about stoking your ego. Uh, but it's a bit more than that. So a true narcissist is very, very prickly and oversensitive. So the very fact that he is so litigious, that he's got a list of litigation, I think that's the one mm. biggest clue out of everything you've said, uh, the one that stands out the most to me, the, the, fact, the very fact that there's so many people, like, if he hears an opposing view and he automatically strikes out and wants it to be crushed as opposed to arguing about it sensibly, that screams narcissism. It also, it's also one of the character traits of internet trolls quite typically that they just don't want to hear any nuance or any balance. They just want to cut down anything that disagrees with them. So on the surface, he seems like a, a, a true narcissist to me. Did you pick up anything on anything just from watching him, like mannerisms and things like that? Or is that is that a bit lay person? For uh, I mean, you I, 
I personally don't think that you can make any kind of uh, accurate diagnosis by looking at somebody's body language. There are many people that have tried to make careers out of that and would disagree with me about that. But my counter to that would be that if you look at formal diagnoses or you know court reports or expert witness stuff that I do, I've never seen anybody ever that's a body um, body language expert that's had any evidence that's been given any level of credibility. So it might be credible mm -hmm. on YouTube, but it's not credible in real life. Uh, but you can still tell how somebody or at least take an, an educated guess at how somebody's reacting to a situation uh, by the by the way they present on youtube and i mm. think he was he was he came across as quite level-headed and quite calm actually mm. uh, which is probably quite telling because he's obviously seething with anger underneath but he didn't really lose a shit to you did he when he was speaking to you no so, but i didn't push that hard yeah he did lose a shit once I offline sent a few messages. Yeah. Um, hmm. But so I suppose he's not really that reactive. So he's not what I would call um, like a sociopath or somebody with antisocial personality disorder. It seems to be different. It's more sort of narcissism. Hmm. Yeah. But wasn't there impression management? Let's say, and I don't think he is a sociopath, but let's say it were a sociopath. Presumably they would be, you know, just no matter how angry they are in their minds, they would be presenting this really calm front. Yeah, so uh, that's more of a psychopath than a sociopath. So even though there's a big overlap between the two, generally speaking, sociopaths tend to be a lot more reactive. So they are not able to keep their cool and wait for the right time to get revenge compared to narcissists. Narcissists are a lot more calculated. Uh, sorry, compared to psychopaths. Psychopaths are a lot more calculated and they can fit into society a lot more effectively. Mm. Whereas a sociopath would uh, probably lash out with anger more easily. I think one of the things... Uh that I found interesting and one the thing that turned the whole thing on its head was the victimhood stuff and what another thing he said was like so you're just going to interview my bullies and it's like I know Kim uh, I've met her be only because I've been interviewing her with with regards to this whole topic uh, but like the idea of her as like this this big bully was just mad to me just having spoken to her a few times and they worked together fine over the years she can't be such a big bully um, but it was always that it's a bully and now you're going to be a bully and now this and that that sort of victimhood stuff it's very um there's something very unattractive about it Do you know what i mean yeah absolutely yeah uh, mm. so we've got some comments from our mutual friend eric hunley who has uh, stated that body language is not something that's ad admitted in court same as a polygraph test which is very true i think there's a misconception that you can just do a lie detector test and it's accurate if that was the case you wouldn't need a judicial system or a judge or a jury would you just do that for every case uh, whereas they can pick up changes in physiology like increased heart rate or you know dilation in the pupils etc etc mm. they that only picks up a physical reaction that doesn't necessarily mean somebody's lying so if you're on a murder charge being accused of of killing somebody you could be innocent but you could be so agitated or anxious at the time that your um your observations your blood pressure your pulse etc changes so that's what's picked up in a polygraph test not the truth yeah I was, at, I was talking to Eric Hunley on his show last night, actually, and I was saying that, and it just happened now as well, as soon as you said the word blood pressure, I suddenly got like an adrenaline jolt because I suddenly imagined myself being asked these questions and I go, oh, like that. I think I would be extremely sensitive uh, and so much so that maybe a polygraph might be a waste on me. Really? I think the opposite. I think I'm, I'm too, too crafty. You wouldn't be able to catch me out. Yeah, you really, I, I see there's nothing behind those eyes, Sean. Which is why I've never been uh, charged with murder. You've never been caught. <laughs> so Eric's just asked, isn't it true that all psychopaths are narcissists, but not all narcissists are psychopaths? Yeah, pretty much. So um, everybody that is a psychopath has to, everybody that's a psychopath has to have a degree of narcissism. I suppose the difference is a few things. First of all, the psychopaths have a lot more going for them. So they're all manipulative and charming. Whereas narcissists are not necessarily manipulative. They all think they're charming, but not all of them are charming. Uh, and I suppose another big difference is that a narcissist always wants to be the centre of attention. Whereas a psychopath, even though they love themselves, they're cunning enough to know when not to be the centre of attention. So they know when to rein it in. They know when they're getting, um, when people around them are disliked to dislike them or when the tide is turning. And they're very good at changing their behaviour uh, to, to adapt to that. Does that make sense? So a, narcissism, a narcissist would not be clever enough to realize when people are disliking them or thinking they're too much up themselves whereas a psychopath interesting might might have those um wants and desires but they're clever enough to uh, to manipulate the situation sounds like um your regular youtuber and and i mean that that i was making that point before i mean what do you think about that i mean to be 
obviously aside from us, but when you look at like, because we're great and everyone else isn't, but like the big YouTubers and stuff, and if you want to be able to, you know, do you see similarities in sort of the, the kinds of personality traits that a cult leader might have to have? And YouTubers? Well, to become a successful YouTuber yeah. or to become the head of a community? Um, yeah, I mean, I think to become a successful YouTuber, especially in now in the climate nowadays when there's so much competition you certainly have to have a few specific personality traits you have to be extremely driven you have to be very good at dealing with rejection um do you have to be manipulative i don't think you have to be i think it helps Hmm. with in certain fields so if you're in a field where it is really good to gain attention and to diss other people uh, then people who are narcissists and people who are psychopaths will definitely thrive in that field so they will uh, be full of them enough and have the confidence and the ego to want to push their own agenda and they'll be willing to stab other people in the back or trample other people to try and get their viewing numbers up. But not all YouTubers are like that. So some, like for example, there's kids who are multimillionaires for un- unboxing presents on channels um, hmm. and you know makeup artists and that kind of people. I don't think you need those traits to, to have your niche in that particular area. So that's Mm. a waffling way to answer your question is I think it depends on the type of YouTube personality. There's definitely some where being narcissistic or being psychopathic will absolutely help, but not the nicer end of YouTube. Yeah, godless scummers saying that's why my channel has so few subs. Me too. That's what I think. (laughs) Fatex, how do you feel about making money out of activism? Is it a necessary evil? What do you think? I think that's for you. Um... That is a re- it is well that is the symbiotic relationship I was describing and it's really really difficult. If you start making money out of activism, you sort of end up in a point when you're relying on the very thing that you are activating against continuing, right? If you, yeah. if your entire money is made from have you know uh, criticizing what Jehovah's Witnesses are doing and then suddenly the Jehovah's Witnesses don't exist anymore, which is presumably your goal, right? That yeah. the whole the church stops being a church, well you also stop having a job. And I can see how that can happen you don't mean it to happen and over the years it is gonna it does happen and you do see some of these people i've seen a few people who are activists or whatever they start being activists on youtube and then they very quickly start to branch out and cover different topics because i think they become aware this isn't going to end well if i keep yeah. you know keep up with that activism at the same time as as dr Shom knows as well as i do the amount of time you have to put into youtube and the few people who have been criticizing me uh from you know the lloyd camp and i i welcome their opinions because it is all food for thought i'm i don't have the final say on this and i'm still trying to work out how i feel so it's really interesting to hear what people are saying um but they start criticizing uh this sort of ad hominem attack that i've seen done to lots of youtubers and it's like you're interested in views and subscribers and it's like well i mean that's literally the job like imagine me going to to somebody's an accountant and like like you only care about the numbers and figures it's like that's your job so this is our job and look we wouldn't have gone into it if we weren't passionate about it i'm really passionate about like looking into cults and activism and stuff like that dr shaham's really passionate about psychiatry and that boring stuff just kidding but (laughs) You know, if we just wanted views and whatever, clicks, we'd be doing cat videos. So we're obviously, there is the passion and the interest, but don't forget that this is our job. Like we do other bits as well. We do other things, but this is like a lot of time. And people come back and they say, you've changed the... Uh, you've changed the picture the, on the thumbnail. What is, what's that about? Like, as if I'm trying to be manipulative. And it's like, well, I'm seeing if it works better and gets more clicks because it's the job. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I've got a few things to say about that. So firstly, about activism, mm. I suppose it depends on what that person's real goal is, because some people will just do something because they're passionate about it, uh, passionate about that particular area. And that's their o- that's their only agenda. But to do it effectively, they might have to dedicate their life to it. And as you say, we need to make a living. You, you can't, you know, you, you rely on people's goodwill and on donations and, you know, YouTube streams to do that. But I suppose it's a fine line between doing that to be able to pay for your lifestyle so that you have more time freed up to follow your cause is, is one aspect, but that's very different to people who, as you say, realize that there's money to be made and change their agenda. So I think it's a fine line. I'd like to think that most people do it for the right reasons, but I absolutely think that there are some people who just jump on the bandwagon. And about the Mm. YouTube thing, absolutely. So just speaking briefly from my experiences, when I first started making videos, they were very information heavy. And I go into lots of medical legal details and break down diagnoses and blah, 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 because that's what I know the most about. And 
I have learned over time to change that to make it much more sharper, snappier, go into less detailed information because I'm just not going to get the attention. And that's not me sort of changing my moralistic beliefs or the core of what I'm about. It's just recognizing that there are things that are going to work and things that aren't. And on a platform like YouTube where anybody can can make a video with just a mobile phone, you have to be savvy enough to make sure that what you're doing gets enough clicks and gets an attention. So it's a balance between doing that without losing your integrity. But yeah. I suppose I'm just seconding what you're saying. It's not easy. It's, it's very, very competitive. So you, you have to do that. And if you didn't do that to a degree, then you're wasting your time, basically. Yeah, there are plenty of things, I think, that you and I, if if we were thinking in purist terms, exactly what we'd like to do, if we could live that way and, and, and live from it on YouTube, the amount of time and hours it takes, I mean, like you say, you, you would be doing different different things. You'd be doing it maybe longer and going into more detail and that kind of thing. I would probably be, right now, I would be making the documentaries I used to make for the BBC. I'd be like going investigating like weird and strange people and, you know, with real life and get a camera team and stuff like that. But the, the amount of money and time that I'd have to spend and then there's no guarantee that even as many people who would watch as they do now, maybe just 10 people watch. And that feeling when you put it out online and it's like, oh yeah, no one's watching this one what a waste my last few hours or weeks were so we do have to you know take bear that in mind sometimes and that but that is also why i wouldn't want uh, activism to be my my thing on youtube especially because I, i've already been, i've been worried for ages about the difference between youtube and act uh, between journalism and activism and i think there's a real blurred line at the moment and there's a lot of people perhaps posing as journalists who really are activists and they're not trying to see the center of the story they're not trying to get both sides and i find that quite frustrating sometimes yeah. got um a, a question from sandra here do you want shall i answer that one um yeah go for about it. What, Read it out, just about what motivated lloyd to tell his producer in the first place oh, and yes, i think that's yeah. a really interesting question um i'll just say that i'm writing a book about secret keeping at the moment um and I'm fascinated by, you know, what we call uh, the fever model, which is when you're carrying a secret, uh, it starts to, your body starts to, or your mind starts to act a little bit like it would do with a fever in the way that you, the, the, the body becomes uninhabitable for a virus uh, when it's a, a physical fever. When it's um, secrets, it becomes uninhabitable in the mind to keep those secrets. That's the theory anyway about secrets. So we're all desperate to get them out and there are certain types of people we tell. There are also theories that by telling people, you sort of make them an accomplice, which is a bit more of a negative spin on, and that's might be, that might be why he told the producer. But I asked him myself and he didn't seem to know. What are your thoughts on why people reveal secrets? So I, I saw the footage of when you asked him and you're right, he seemed very confused, didn't he? Um, and I think he probably he must massively regret it because it kind of changed the trajectory of where he was going. And um, what are my thoughts on why people tell secrets? I'm not really mm. sure, to be honest. I, I got a couple of secrets myself, and I I don't feel compelled for either of those reasons to tell anybody. Like I don't. What kind of like secrets do you have? <laughs> I'm not telling you, obviously. No, just what sort? What sort? <laughs> Is it because the most common ones? I'm trying to remember what they all are. Like um, from your lover from uh often about abortion that's one of them uh drugs uh just nod nod uh love <laughs> keep my head still. <laughs> he nodded oh god yeah no it yeah it's, well you probably but you're a you're a psychopath dr Sholm, so that's different so you don't feel the fever model but i mean it makes sense from um you look at like things like game theory and you look at like the way we evolved with tribes and things and it makes sense for the tribe as a whole for the individuals within it to want to get their secrets out um because a tribe where everybody just keeps their own secrets is not going to be as, as successful and that's the interesting thing about it because obviously for the individual they are better off if they're able to live happily keeping big secret so that individual is better but the tribe is not and if the tribe does badly the individuals do badly so it's a really interesting dynamic between uh you know and, and so obviously what's happened over the years the tribes that were most successful were the ones where people felt they had to reveal certain things and things weren't kept from the tribe and again going back to that culty or communal communal aspect of the whole lloyd evans saga it's really interesting to look at you know again he felt he had to tell someone from his tribe either just to feel better it could be just to get some reassurance. Oh, come on, it wasn't that bad what you did. Or it could be to make those people an accomplice. I've heard that's a popular tactic in prisons and stuff. You tell someone something and now suddenly they're in on it as well. And they feel the same burden of keeping the secret that you do. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, you're the one writing the book, so I defer to your expertise, but that will make sense <laughs> to me. As um, long as before... well, you're the, you are, literally are the expert, so I defer to your expertise. <laughs> Um, before we wrap up, any other final questions for anybody in the comments section? Hmm. How's Joe's, this? Go, while we, oh, go on, go on. What are you saying? Joe's asking me about psychopathy and head injury. Um, it's. I'll give you the short answer, Joe. So I don't think I don't think head injuries lead to somebody being a psychopath, but they can certainly lead to what we call frontal lobe syndrome. So your frontal lobes are the lobes at the front of your brain. Uh, they control a number of things, such as speech and language, some elements of memory, but they also control. Uh, your inhibition or disinhibition so somebody who has hmm. very specific injuries in that area can become quite aggressive and can act in a very disinhibited manner same kind of thing as you'd act if you're drunk so not look, looking through the or thinking through the consequences of your actions occasionally these can violence as well that's my one minute answer god i love it i love hearing you talk man it's lovely <laughs> oh shucks stop it mr gold <laughs> stop flicking me okay yeah. any last questions for anybody while we're um, waiting for them i'll just uh I'll just say I've very much enjoyed this. It's a bit nice. We should do this kind of thing more often, shouldn't we? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Why don't you tell my viewers about uh, your podcast and what's going oh. on? Like? Oh, get out of here. Well, I suppose I should mention it a bit more. Uh, oh, I'm going to talk about Louis through in a second. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, On the Edge with Andrew Gold, it was primarily an audio podcast. I made it because I was finding it more and more difficult to make uh, documentaries for the BBC. Uh, they wouldn't let me do some of the more extreme ideas. So I have people on there like that you could never really have on mainstream TV. A couple of times I interviewed, you, you know, child sex offenders. I won't say what we call them, but the P word. Um, celebrity people as well, like David Baddiel or Amanda Knox, just to get inside their heads, find out what they're, what's going on. And a lot of it is to do with this kind of cultish ideological thinking on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, and I often get in trouble for that because the people who are a little bit more right wing who, who follow me get upset when I have a go at that or I put someone on who got too right wing or something. And the people who are very left wing aren't happy when I have a go at something like the woke culture and stuff like that so it's all about you know we try to stay centered but it's all about the ideologies and the extremes and stuff and I should say that my channel right now is on 4,987 subscribers so I'm hoping by the end of this if you guys come and subscribe I might hit 5,000 and I can celebrate and do a big Q&A about it next week so if I, if I if so, if I get enough subscribers from from this now I'll be very excited and do a Q&A so um yeah, lots of lots of similar stuff to Shom, and also Doctor Shom is on the podcast. Uh, and I should add, I put it; it's on YouTube now as well. It's not just on on audio, so it's all the videos and and stuff. And I would strongly encourage, if not insist, for my viewers to come uh, go and check out your podcast and subscribe. Oh, thank you. Okay, did you want to answer that question on Lee through, and then yeah. let's wrap up after that? Sure. Where was it? I can't find it. It is now. living oh, yes. here. It says, "Have you ever analysed Louis through?" Yes, I have analysed him and I've spoken uh, with him because he watched my exorcism film on the BBC when I was exposing an exorcist because I was trying to be very similar to him. I obviously grew up watching him and I really enjoy his work. And I was speaking to his like his production company for a while about ideas together because he's going off screen and things haven't quite happened. But I, I have watched him and one of the best things that I've seen him do, I, I, I've analysed lots of little clips of him, but there are times where, oh, what was it? in Louis and the Nazis, there's this time where somebody, he's trying to get information from someone uh, and he does this amazing thing psychologically. Um, he asks this guy like, were you involved in some sort of prison thing, right? And the guy doesn't want to say. So, and, and they're at his house, the guy's house. Uh, the guy's like, oh, I'm not, oh, I'm not talking about that. And they go out into the garden uh, of the guy's house. They're looking around and they walk around the pool. The guy's like, let me show you the, the views. There's like some views of some cliffs and stuff like that. And Louis doesn't push further, trying to find out the answer from this guy. He just walks, and then for some reason, this is a really strange thing to do, he walks in front of the guy who is showing him his house. And you can find this on, I think, on Netflix, or maybe it's iPlayer, but Louis and the Nazis, halfway through somewhere. Um, he starts sort of dawdling, just walking a bit in front of this guy, and just acting really uninterested. Um, and the guy then is sort of racing to catch up with Louis, even though he's supposed to be showing him around his house. So I notice how the dynamic changes very quickly from the guy shutting up and being like, no, I'm not telling you this thing, I'm showing you my house now, to Louis now walking, and the guy's trying to follow him and try and impress him, and Louis looks really uninterested. And then they get to the end of the garden, they're looking at the views and stuff, and 
Louis, I think, finally can see the dynamics changed. And he says, he asks again, just like, so what, what was this prison stuff? And the guy tells him everything. Really? And it was just an amazing little psychological trick that I learned watching Louis through of just like, if you want to know stuff, don't let the person know that you want to know. You're okay. the, they need to impress you with their stories. So that's so it. So when you were saying that, that reminded me of negging. You know, have you heard of um, oh, yeah. the game? Is it called the game with Neil Strauss? Yeah. So for anybody watching this who doesn't know, uh, there is a movement, I think it's fair to call that, of, of yeah. pickup artists, basically, who are average kind of looking guys who, who make it their business and their profession even to go around picking up women. And there's entire kind of language and, and theory and strategies that yeah. they use behind us. And one of the main ones is negging. So if you have a target, so an attractive female that you want to get on your side, you you don't you pay them a bit of attention but not quite enough and you always want them you always leave them wanting more so for example if you approach a group and you want to chat up one particular target you apply to her but you ignore her and you focus on everybody else around her so she then wants your attention uh, or you give her a compliment which is both an insult at the same time and that's called negging or something like um those earrings look good on you. They don't usually suit somebody with such a round face or something like that. So it's both an, uh, an insult and a compliment. If you keep doing that, then they, they kind of try and seek your approval. And once they start on that path, apparently it continues and supposedly leads to sex. I'm not sure that I buy any of this, but it's still interesting psychologically just to, uh, as yeah. a theory. So that's what it sounds like Louis Theroux was doing. Yeah. I don't know if he was well, doing it instinctively or intentionally, but it seems like... I it. remember you telling me you were a big fan of that book, weren't you? You used it uh, a lot over the years. <laughs> that's my secret. <laughs> yeah that was the secret no that's not true at all um yeah i th the louis thing's interesting because people always ask him like you know are you are you playing a role are you doing this or that and he says i'm just sort of being myself there's a really interesting thing i mean we could talk for hours about this but like with with, with regards to self there is a change when there's a camera on you and i've noticed myself when i do documentaries and go to these places that are quite dangerous i mean i'm a coward i would never go to these places but as soon as a camera is like on me it's like shining on my face you you're being yourself, but you're like, you're almost watching yourself from the outside and you're, you're sort of being entertained by the documentary and the film that's being made. So I think he is being himself, but he's also always going to be very aware of, of what he's doing and he'll know like, huh, he's not answering me. I'm just going to sort of walk and I think this might get the answer out of him. Yeah. yeah interesting. So he is much craftier than he might come across, Louis III. Yeah, it's like, a, it's, it's like, crafty and not crafty it's like natural and not natural I don't I don't believe he I don't imagine he's thinking too much about it it's just it, it's sort of second nature to him uh but I think if he were to be really honest and look inside maybe he'd he'd see there is a craft to it and and I'm sure he'd like to think there is a craft right he's he's made a whole career out of it and it would be sad probably to look back on your oeuvre and think I was just bumbling around and it just happened to work. There has to be some psychological craft behind it, you'd, ho you'd hope. And I don't think yeah. that's being manipulative at all. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you so mm. much, Mr. Gold, for coming on and explaining what happened with Lloyd Evans. Um, that's really interesting. I it certainly cleared up a lot of my questions. And thank you so much for all our contributors of your comments and questions. Hope you enjoyed it. It's the first time I've tried to do a live stream. So I've kind of frightened that it would go wrong technologically but as far as i can tell this is all worked <laughs> they've not heard us recorded. the whole time <laughs> unless none of this <laughs> is recorded <laughs> um, oh. but stay in touch andrew and um, we, we've got a couple of collaborations in the bank haven't we that will be coming up on both of our channels within the next few weeks uh, talking about some very serious serial killers haven't we yeah uh, yeah they're coming out on my audio podcast and i'll put them out on the video and they'll come out on yours as well so people will probably have to watch them twice so we both get the views uh we've collaborated before as well it's always been really really nice and fast becoming best friends so you have to tell me what those secrets are it's a very uh very incestual world of youtube isn't it and i promise yeah. you I won't tell i won't tell anybody your secrets about killing those prostitutes so <laughs> it's all good <laughs> oh. all right nice to meet you Goodbye, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Bye, everyone. Hello, Holly Grant. <laughs> Hello, bye, everyone. <laughs>